my name's Joanne Brown, and I do a little Facebook page on history, and I've always been intrigued with the Cherokee, and as, as most people down south, everybody thinks they've got somebody in the past, and our family does too, so um, I've presented programs like this to a lot of kids, like in scouting groups and things like that, and I've helped set up a, uh, a camp down at Watery, Lake Watery in uh, South Carolina near the Catawba Nation, just uh, so we could have a place to teach where we could go outside with the kids and show them the skills, show them the um, wiki apps and the things like that, you know, all, all kinds of things. So, we're talking about who was here in this area before the white folks came here. Were they Cherokee? And whose land is this? That's kind of what we're talking about. Well, what uh, seemed to have been here before, we're not for sure, but it seemed to have been the mound builders. About 1300 is when we think that they started. And there's, um, there's a lot of artwork in there that looks very Aztec or Inca like. And in Tennessee, there are 12 mounds near Nashville. And there are so many, you can't even count them. I mean, the Brick Church, Pike, Moody, the Effigy Rabbit Mounds, Shiloh, Savannah, Robinson Shell Mounds. There's one in Valley Cruces you might not know about. The Woodard uh, Mound in Cheatham County. You have the Heatherly Mounds in Camp Campbell County. You have an eff you might have effigies that look like bears, snakes, and birds. These were quite complicated, but we don't have to say that somebody some UFO, you know, somebody from outer space helped them. I mean they 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 built towers and so uh, they could see what they looked like. This is the Pinson in uh, Nashville, and like I said, there's about 12 of them there. These were ceremonial type mounds. The uh, headmen of the tribe might have a, a home there on the very top. Uh, often they had burials in them, and sometimes they even had a council room in there. And there was excavation done by Duke Energy sponsoring it. Uh, at a mound that's on the watery lake. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the construction. They found that they had sod bricks that they used. You could still see them. And they had grass. They just cut out pieces of grass with the dirt under there and made bricks. And they stacked, literally stacked walls in these mounds before they brought in the dirt. And that helped stabilize it so it didn't all wash off and all fall apart. So that was uh, sort of the construction of them. Now in this area, we do have a few trail markers. There's one right out here near Dewey Christian Church. And these were uh, used by, we don't know whether it was Cherokee. I would say most of these around here were Cherokee because the older trees would be dead by now. So there are some on Beach Mountain, Grandfather, and I thought I saw some on Elk Knob. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, they just didn't look natural, so I'm thinking that may have been. Now, the one on beach, the ones on beach are actually twisted knot type things, and they're, they're very interesting. Tennessee has the highest amount of art caves in the whole United States, and most of these are up on the Cumberland Plateau. Now, um, I had a local tell me that over in, I'm from Ashe County, and he said that there was a horse at one time on a little rock ledge on the New River, but it has been washed away. That New River has flooded so much, so it, it washed it away. And that's the number one problem that archaeologists have, is trying to preserve the, the artwork because, um, you know, you get a lot of vandalism. You, you have people wanting to add their own graffiti to it. And so for that reason, they don't give the location of all of them when they're found. When you go back and try to look at the research, you won't see a location at all. Now, the European con contact was in the 1500s, and this was, of course, the Spanish. Now, you'll hear stories of the Vikings and different groups from Europe. And the Vikings, according to what we hear, they were just about everywhere. We don't know. Um, we weren't there, so unless we find evidence of it, we, we don't know. So the uh, 
the European contact was actually devastating when the Spanish came here, and I'll tell you why in a minute. These are some of the suggested trail um, routes that De Soto took, and of course he was based uh, close to Tampa, Florida, coming up through there, and he spread so much destruction and mayhem because he, he didn't ask for help. He demanded it. And if you didn't give it, he'd cut off the hand of the person he asked. Uh, you've got to remember the 1500s were the Dark Ages, and he, these people were coming from Spain. And in Spain, what was going on during the 1500s? Anybody know? You had the Spanish Inquisition. And so these people were all about torture. I mean, it, it was terrible stuff. And so they did it all through here. And... The uh, Indian population after the Spanish contact went down 90%, 90% that um, it just decreased. And, and this just shows, you know, I'm glad no kids are here, but this, it, and these are actual illustrations by some of the folks that were here. You know, that's cutting off an uh, arm there. Now, they left maps, the Spanish did, and this one is particularly in interesting. The Zuala there in the middle is what we think was located in Morganton, North Carolina, and we'll talk about that. I had opportunity to go down there, and I met uh, Mr. Uh, Robin Beck, who's down in the, the hole there on the right, but uh, they, this was... Uh, Fort San Juan, and Juan Port Pardo is actually the one that built this, and this was a little bit later than um, De Soto, and they found evidence of moats there, the entrance into the place, and if you're familiar with this story, uh, Juan Pardo built about six forts, it came in off Paris Island, and all through the inland of North Carolina and South Carolina, he built forts along the way. They think there was one down at Asheville area, and so he would have been up up here. And of course, this one. Now, Robin Beck, the owner of the property, was just a teenager, and he found there is so much pottery there; it's unreal. But he found some that was different, and so he took it. He took it over to Warren Wilson College and. Um, they identified it as Spanish in origin, so, um, or, you know, from Spain. And they found an olive jar. They found the mesh that the men wore on their armor. Um, you know, just different different pieces of things that they they've located there. And I, like I said, I went down there for a dig. <laughs> it was ninety it was ninety degrees that day, and I was glad they canceled it. Nobody showed up, and I, I thought. You know, I'm here, you know, if they were going to cancel it, why didn't they send me an email or something? And Robin came over to me, and he had a garden back behind this area. <laughs> he said, you better be glad they canceled it because they make all the visitors do the digging. <laughs> and, and they sit over there under the, the little t canopy tent in the shade, and you're out there in the sun digging with a wheelbarrow and shovel. So anyway, and, and this was exactly what it looked like. Now, there had been a tarp on it when I was there, and it, but the wind had blown it off. And he's actually down, if you can identify it, they actually went down uh, at the entrance way, just cutting down and, and showing uh, some of the different levels under there. So how did they figure out if it was a Spanish site or not? They, they're doing it because of the uh, pottery in most, most places cases because that's what they're looking at. If somebody says, oh, this might be a possible site, they have to go in and confirm it with the pottery. And that's what uh, Duke Energy was uh, sponsoring this dig down on Lake Watery. And they did find some artifacts there that they think are Spanish in origin. So they're pretty sure that might have been, uh, and I'm going to have to actually see this word to pronounce it. So I'm, I'm going to wait for a minute. I'll tell you what town it was. But there are so many thousands of pottery pieces around. If you find them, don't send it to the Smithsonian. Keep it. 
I mean, I went to Valley Brook over here at ETSU, and they have thousands of boxes of them. And they're sending it all over the world. Why can't we leave some stuff right here in Johnson County, you know, <laughs> and give it to Jenny upstairs because we need, we need uh, you know, a little better exhibit, um, a little better, uh, you know, and, and the stuff they found at Mamie, that's where it's at, at the Smithsonian. You know, that's it's a shame. Now, artifacts were found at Old Butler when the lake came down. I, I had a map that showed the different sites there. I think it was 36 that they found when they let down the lake. And the reason being is that, you know, the topsoil's gone and it's washing it down. And, and how you identify an Indian site is by the uh, fire cracked stone at, at the hearth. You're gonna see charcoal still there, it's still there, and you're gonna see these stones. They, the uh, Native Americans built hearths and they would line them with rocks. And these rocks, as they heated them up, they would crack and everything. So that, that's what they're looking for. When, if you see archeologists walking around the lake when it's down, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for those charcoal and the dark rocks and cra usually cracked. And they might find some artifacts there. And you can go to the museum and they have several things that were found there. Now, there, uh, one thing that's important to help establish the pottery, you know, where it came from and everything, is the temper inside of it. And when you make pottery, they would put sand or crushed stone, even crushed shell in it. And those are different stages of, for a better word, evolution in, in their pottery making. And that helps establish who is there. And, um, you know, and it may have even been some trade pottery. We don't know if it's got shell in it. It's very unlikely it originated here. Um, you can tell by the stamp designs on it. And they would do that. They would take something like a spatula, a wooden spatula, and they, and they might have a cord on there or even bark that they would impress the outside. And what they weren't doing that just to decorate it. Of course, they did put some pretty designs on it, but that helped keep the pottery from cracking whenever they fired it. So you, you always would uh, temp uh, put that temper in there and, and stamp it as well to, to help make it a more substantial pot. Here's a picture of some of the, the temper. This is uh, crushed limestone, and the one on the bottom is actually uh, crushed shell. And then over on the, rock, on the right is just uh, some sand. And now if you're looking, if you're trying to, if you found something out in your field and you're thinking, is this a rock? Now we have some really neat rocks around here that I looked at and I thought, this looks like a piece of an old crock or something. And it's actually the stone because our stone around here is really interesting. When, when you get the gravel and stuff from Maymead, it's, it's kind of neat. But uh, the way you tell whether it's a stone or a piece of pottery is looking in the inside, just like that picture on the right, and looking for the temper. And does it crush? Pottery's gonna break, a rock is not. And if it's hard as a rock, it's a rock. <laughs> okay, now one thing that we have a lot around here of is the local native burials. And you, uh, this book is in the library, and many of you remember this story of the men that got arrested for grave robbing. That's a felony, folks. I mean, those people, even if it was a Native American, give them some dignity and death. You know, we do not have the right to up-earth somebody's remains. They need to be at rest. And that's what was going on in this cave, and you can see all the chambers in there when the archaeologists did go in the robbers had already cleaned it out pretty pretty bad and uh, they found a, a plastic bag with a hundred skulls in it so there were well over a hundred burials here and they found some other interesting things here they found bones of a horse in here and i thought that was kind of kind of neat and the, um, of course they saw their diet there they found a lot even though the archaeologists found a lot of things that were still there. Now, most of you don't know, but um, there's something called the Ward site on Cove Creek and Watauga River over just down the road, 421. 
This is very significant. It proves that this was not just a tourist trap even for Indians coming up in the summer. They were here all year long, and this site proves that. And I'll show you why. Do you see the uh, round circle there? That is actually a house, uh, what was a house, and you will notice that there's two rows of uh, where they had their poles. This was a uh, wattle and daub structure that they had there, and the center part is a fire. So they were here in cold weather. If you were here in the summer, you might not need a fire. You know, I don't know, our weather's sort of funny here, so you might, but they had center, they had two walls in there. So they had some insulating property in that outside wall. So you, you will see two rows there. Now, as, as you look at the top, I didn't get the whole picture in here. You'll see a, a, a line of uh, pole holes on the top as well. That's the palisade around there where they, it was actually like a fort set up. And this is about 150 feet across and then all these little dots are uh, storage bins and um, hearths and things like that. So there was a lot there and they're very excited about that and it has been researched. Now this is a close up, this was about, I think it was about 16 feet across, but this is a close up of the, uh, the double walled home that they excavated there. And those things that look like holes, um, the bigger ones I'm talking about maybe at uh, seven o'clock and eight, but uh, those are actually storage pits. The natives would put the corn and things in, in hickory nuts, walnuts, right there in their, in their building with them. These are some of the artifacts they found there, and you'll see quite a bit of pottery there. Um, now that one down on the bottom is very interesting, the one with red paint on it, that is Moravian. So um, Moravian pottery found its way all the way up here. It's a couple hours by car to drive down there to Winston-Salem, but uh, we had some trading going on because that, those artifacts were here. Now it's possible that those came from Benjamin Ward they did find evidence of a log cabin there that they think is his log cabin, so it's possible that it was his. They did find these stone discs there that I think are really neat. This was a game, uh, sort of like a little hockey thing, and uh, so they, they found three of those there. And this is a very incredible site as well, the Cane Notch site, and it's over on the Nolichucky, and it hasn't been but about 12 or 15 years that they discovered this. This young man was Nathan Shreed. He was, um, he and his dad were kayaking on the Nolichucky, and it had been storming, and you know, you really shouldn't get out in the water whenever it's rough. And he and his dad decided to pull out because it was just too rough for them. And that Nolichucky has some pretty, you know, it has some pretty strong rapids on it. And so they pulled out, and as he was going up the bank, there was all kinds of pottery sticking out of the ground. And that's what water does for us. It exposes all this stuff. And he grabbed some of it and he took it over to ETSU. And he changed it, it changed his whole life. He became an archeologist, you know, uh, after discovering that. And I'll show you some of the things they did over there. It's about 15 acres that they discovered and it's uh, actually close to Irwin, Tennessee. Um, they, uh, I think this is a mag magometer that they're using right here, but they would walk walk the whole field. It was a cornfield, and they walked it. And all these little spots here are possibilities of uh, Native American structures. Right here, they know this is a house structure that was there. They found a council house there. And um, now, who was it talking to me about beads earlier? Uh, the, the chevrons and stuff like that. Yes, yes. Okay, they found chevron beads there. Uh, and you see that real pretty blue one in the center there. They were real proud of that. But if you'll notice the pottery, and they're pretty sure that this is uh, Cherokee pottery. And um, that's something I did want to mention. Oh, you know, what did I do with it? 
all those broken pieces. I had a, a rim that I was bringing in to show you the way the pottery was made by the Cherokees, a little different. They would actually uh, pull the rim up, fold it over, and then press it in. And then, uh, as you can see, they used a piece of cane, river cane, and went in there and pressed it and made that design on it. So that's how an archaeologist can determine if, um, if the pottery around here is Cherokee or not. And there hasn't been any found in Johnson County that I know of that is quali what they call koala pottery. And the, um, the, the, I guess you'd call that a stone. Um, that was actually worn around the neck and they call it a gorget, gorget? Gorget. So that's what that is. They found that there. Um, this was what was really, really exciting. That pot that's put back together there on the top had hominy remnants in it. So uh, when you cook, when you soak your hominy overnight in lye, they used ashes. It made it five times more nutritious. So that's, that's the way the Indian ate, the, ate their corn. And there's a creek and I'm not sure where it is. I was just reading about it in an account of Hominy Creek and asked me afterwards how it got that name. But uh, anyway, they found this stone tool on it. And here's Dr. J. Frank Franklin. He's not here anymore at e ETSU, but he was the head of the uh, archaeology department over there. And this is at Valley Brook Lab, and I was able to go there. I didn't meet him, but I did see all these pots. Now the red ones on the back are reproductions. So every time that they would have the, the, the pottery um, kind of take shape as they glue it, I mean, that's what they're doing at the lab. They're going through all these, these trays, and trays and trays of pottery, trying to see if they match and come up with a complete piece. But they, would, uh, have, they have a potter in the area that can duplicate that. And I think she did a pretty good job there if you can tell what he's got in his hand and what's behind of it. So she, she duplicates the pottery and that's what they send out. And they'll, they'll make dozens of these copies and they'll send them out to museums. So you, you're not gonna see the cracked pots that have been glued up. They're gonna stay right there in the lab in most cases. This is a close up of the uh, cane notch bowl that they um, had there he was holding in his hand. This is Dr. Dean. Um, he's passed away. I think he passed away from COVID just a couple years ago, but um, he had a field school. You could go over to the gray fossil site with anything that you found, and he would identify and tell you what year, you know, the, the date of it. So he, he was wonderful. He was the one that would walk the lakes, and uh, he worked with the TVA and every, every time they dropped a lake, he, he would get permission from them to go out there and walk it and identify the sites. At Boone Lake, I think they found 80 sites when they dropped that. You know, that was down for dam repair for several years. I had friends that lived there and they had a fit that they left it down so long, but it had some serious problems. Now, what did the first explorers see? Now, this is an actual photo, uh, drawing, I should say from one of the explorers, but they saw naked natives and they grew corn everywhere and they had thatched houses. And these, these were more of a longhouse style. And this would have been closer to the coast um, as they were coming in here. And I, I don't know whether you can tell, but th there's three stages of corn. They have the first planting right behind the little post. There's six posts there above the Indians that are dancing and um, that's new corn, and then they had green corn growing, and then they, on the very back, they had ripe corn ready to harvest, so it was, it was ready to go. And uh, one of the explorers said there were just miles and miles and miles of corn. That was their, their uh, the one main food that they had. Okay, now the Cherokee were very late comers to the area, they have the legend that they came in here about 1100 uh, AD. They have uh, DNA traces back to New York tribes, the uh, tribes that are up there around Lake Erie. And um, so they think they migrated here, but I heard one Cherokee lady say, you know, it's possible 
that the Cherokee here went up there. So you you never know, you know, if, if you weren't here. But um, Timberlake, and I'm sorry, I don't know his first name. He was a lieutenant with the British Army, and they had built Fort Loudon over going towards Knoxville. And you can see it off I-40. You can pull off there and, and go visit this reconstructed fort and there were um, several towns up through here and he sketched this this uh, this map showing the the different towns th here and this is where Dragon Canoe and Nancy Ward were from and they were from um, Chota that's right there in the center so they had a long way to go now one thing that um, Timberlake did, he arranged for some of the chiefs to go to London. And you can see that they were quite tattooed and they did strange things with their hair. But look at their ears, especially that second guy. Do you know what that is? That is cartilage. That is their living cartilage. Of course, it's kind of dried out, but they would they would kind of separate that off the rest of the ear and they would put beads and stuff in it and they would it made them look rather fierce I know it would scare me to death if I saw a man with ears like that I mean they do some strange things these days but I've never seen anybody <laughs> mutilate their cartilage like this you know that's kind of crazy but anyway whenever they took them in to have an audience with the king and I think this was uh, King George III at this time, but um, they thought it was the ladies were going to pass out. They were so scared of these guys. So they grabbed a turban off somebody on the street from India and they wrapped it around the guys' heads to cover up some of the tattoos in their ears. And it started a fashion statement. Whenever those guys came back, they brought the turbans with them. And uh, as you can see there, Sequoia's got one on. <laughs> so anyway, it, it, everybody wanted one. I mean, men are kind of vain too, so they came over here and everybody wanted the turban. And you notice what he's wearing, you know, um, he's got on a trade coat, and that was, that was the very, very common way for the Cherokee men to dress. They wore a hunting, hunting style jacket and uh, there were seven clans of the Cherokee. They had a seven-sided council house, and there was a reason for that. They called the Great Spirit Yahweh, and um, they, their word for red clay is Adana and um, Adam. So they, they liked the creation story, and the missionaries were very much able to witness to them. Um, I think it was about 1811, the Baptists set up right down at um, near Cherokee, North Carolina, a, a mission school for them. And the Moravians very early on did witnessing to them and sent missionaries out to them. And they were able to, I mean, they, they recognized this, the six days of creation and the seventh of the Lord rested. So... Um, I always thought that was quite interesting, and I will tell you this story. Um, if you go to Winston-Salem, the old Salem section, you're going to see some old organs in there. And they date back to when they first came over here, like 1600s. There are two of them I know of. And you have to pump them, I mean, on the side, and it gets enough air in there where it'll go for a couple of songs. And the Cherokee went down there. And they heard a concert on those organs. And the Cherokee chief's wife, and when it was over, she said, let that little man out of that box. <laughs> he can't be breathing in there for, you know, over an hour, you know, let him out. And they had to actually open up the back to prove to her that there wasn't a little man in there making all that noise. But, um, there's been a lot of, I, I want to bring this up, there's been a lot of research lately on the Watauga Purchase. And um, they came up with some new lines. They started looking at it a little bit. And that line goes all the way to Sparta. So it encompasses Ash County and you know, you'll see West Jefferson up there in the corner. And that's what they think it really looked like. And we, I hadn't 
thought of that before being part of that purchase. But you know, Henderson's the one that came over and um, tried to get Daniel Boone to negotiate this large land purchase of Kentucky, base, basically. And he gave them six loads of wagon goods and 2,000 pounds sterling of silver. And um, some of the guys signed up, signed off on it, but Dragging Canoe said, no way. He said, you're trading off all of our hunting lands. And so he vowed, he told Daniel Boone, he said, it will be a dark and bloody land. Don't think that it's going to be easy. And it was not. Daniel Boone lost two sons. He lost a brother. His daughter was kidnapped. And he, he was even kidnapped for a little while. And um, finally was able to get get out of Dodge and warn the, the um, fort that they had established over there. They were planning an attack on it, and he knew he had to get out of there and, and warn them. I wanted to tell you about the Fry Jefferson map a bit here. Um, Jefferson is named Jefferson because Peter Jefferson was in the area trying. They, were, they always had a dispute on the Virginia line for uh, North Carolina. This was North Carolina at that time. And so he came to try to settle it and um, produce this map uh, with Fry. And um, it, you can't really see it. And I did have a close up of it, but down there in the corner where we lie, it's, it's showing some mountains there. And it actually shows an Indian road leading out of the area where Steep Rock is. How many of you know what Steep Rock is? Now, Greg does, but yeah. So, uh, Steep Rock is? Yep, yep, yep. We can still climb on that Steep Rock. My daughter had her fiance go up there and, and, and propose to her as they were rappelling down the Steep Rock. <laughs> we call it backbone, but anyway. Um, this is one of the earliest known sketches of a Cherokee, and this comes from the Von Rick Journal, and it was found in the Copenhagen Museum just a few years ago. And you'll notice uh, that they, uh, the male wore leggings, and, I, I, and, they, and they were indigo like this, and I'm thinking, did, did the Indians have a source of indigo? Or were they trading for that at that time? I don't know. But you can see that they wore the blankets over their shoulders um, instead of a coat. He has on a breech cloth, and um, she has on a skirt. But I'm going to show you the style skirt. Well, let's see. I might have the, the next picture on here. Oh, I don't think that's up. Yeah, it's up here. No, I don't. One of the artists sketched it, and this is all the women wore. And it, I'm not going to model it, but that, that's all they wore. I mean, all they wore. <laughs> I mean, it was even open in the back. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everything was hanging out. So, anyway, this is something else that I'm really excited about. A surgeon was visiting the College of Surgeons over in London, and he saw some pictures on the wall, and this was, I think it was the Huntington Collection, and I have, actually have the documentation for it. He said, who are these men? Nobody knew. That's Dragging Canoe and his son. These are the only no, known pictures I have ever seen of Dragging Canoe and his son, and they went to London, this was the very year that Dragging Canoe died, and I, I researched this. I thought, is this true? And I researched it, and um, it was the Indian uh, agent for um, Great Britain at that time. And, you know, the war was already over. I don't know how they did it, but anyway, the Cherokee, of course, fought for the British in the American Revolution. And... They arranged for uh, Dragon Canoe and his son to go to London. And the guy that arranged it, he wanted to use this for PR, so he had their portraits done, and he had posters done of this. And what confirms this is one of the posters were found in, um, was found at Chattanooga in a Cherokee home. So, and, and 
you know, it looks to be authentic. And um, you'll notice his earrings, and they wore nice clothes. They, they did a lot of trading. And um, a word about what he's wearing on the side. Let's see if I can. Can I find anything here? I had a roll of red fabric. Now I don't see it. Oh, there it is. One of their favorite trade items was just silk. And so they would get this stuff, and the guys, the guys liked it as well as the women. But they would just wear it over their shoulder like that and then pull it over to one side. And so that's what you're seeing. And they have, have it trimmed there. They put the ribbons on it. The men loved ribbons. And these, these were ribbons from France, so they were silk. And uh, their favorite color of ribbon was red. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Nanahi. Now this is who we know as Nancy Ward. And there's no known pictures of her, so this is just an artist's interpretation at the Tennessee Archives, so you can kind of see. She was called the Beloved Woman. And um, let me go back to that picture. She earned that title from the Cherokee, but she was beloved by the white people too. And I'll tell you why. Um, you know, her husband was Kingfisher, and there was a battle in the 1740s between two tribes. And she was there chewing the bullets so they would penetrate a little rougher lead bullets. And uh, her husband got shot and killed in the battle. So she grabbed up his rifle and rallied the troops, and they won. The Cherokee were able to win that, and they, they really appreciated her bravery. So they gave her the title of Beloved Woman. woman. And um, she had a, to identify that status, she had a white swan. This is a swan feather. White swan feather that she carried, and that was a feather of authority. And she could go to the council meeting, and if she wanted to speak, she just laid that down. And she, she had the opportunity to speak. She could determine the status of people, you know, if they were captured white people, you know, if they lived or died just by putting that down. And there was an incident, and I shared it last time I was there here, but uh, Russell Bean's wife was at Fort Watauga, and whenever everybody went into the fort because the Cherokee were on the warpath, um, Lydia went out, and you'll hear this if you go over there for the uh, program that they do each summer. But she went out to get her cows. You know, that's very, very important if you've got a milk cow that you keep it milked every day or it's going to go dry and you don't want that. You want that milk. And so she and another young boy um, went back to her fields and retrieved her cattle. And before they could get back to the fort, they were attacked. And the young boy and her were taken, and they got all the cows too. The Cherokee took the cows. And they had already burned at the stake the young boy. And Lydia Bean was there roasting, <laughs> fixing, fixing to die. And Nancy ran in there and with her bare hands put out that fire and, and put down that feather and said, this woman will live and saved her life, but she didn't send her home right away. They had the cows, and she said, I want you to teach me what to do with these things. So she showed the Cherokee how to do butter, how to milk them, how to uh, do buttermilk, butter, cheese, all kinds of things. And when she was sent home, uh, they kept the cows. <laughs> and Nancy had a lot of cattle up to the day she died. Now, she, she was quite, uh, she got to go to the treaty meetings and things like that because she was quite a spokesman for the Cherokee, and she warned of many attacks. She warned of attacks at uh, Long Island on the Holston, and uh, she was a friend of uh, Severe here in the picture. This is the same one that's on the wall here, and that's Andrew Jackson on the, on the right, but... Um, she went to a council, they were working out a treaty, and she went to a council and she saw that there were no white women at the council and she said, 
where are your women? You know, in the Cherokee culture, they have a matrilineal line there, and the women have a lot of status. And whenever a man gets married, he marries into her clan, and yet he has to raise his children, his uh, sister's children. So I, I, I don't know how they do that because they don't marry in, in the same tribe. So they have to, I mean, in the same clan, they have seven clans. So um, they, he would actually have to raise his own, uh, his somebody else. His, I guess his wife's brother would raise his kids, and he would raise his sister's kids. So that's how that worked. And the property was all in the woman's name as well. Now this is the Augusta, Georgia Chronicle, and I think it's 1783. I can't quite, it's so blurred up there in the corner I can't read it but um, as I was as I saw this I got really excited about it it tells of a battle that John Sevier had not too far from us all over almost at Sam's Gap I guess in Irwin but um, there were and this is another proof that Indians lived here in the winter the warriors were encamped some um, on the Flint River over there in the winter time and of course, they were on the war path after the Transylvania Purchase, you know, Dragon Canoe went on the war path. And this uh, episode with him, or these war parties, which were pretty well hit and run type things that he would do, um, that went on for 19 years. So it, it was pretty bad living here. And a lot of the people that had settled in here either were living in forts or they went down to Winston-Salem and stayed in there and their fortifications. But, you know, it was not a good time to live around here. I know on the New River in Ash County, there was a family of five that were uh, scalped there and died. And we have stories. There's even some in the Historical Society's books about the kidnappings that went on in this area, so it, um, they would come in and they, sometimes they would kill the kids too, but uh, a lot of times if they had lost a child, they would take the child to replace theirs. So uh, there was an Osborne family that uh, had a son and daughter that were kidnapped and they were taken really far away and tried to escape several times and um, the boy was killed trying to escape and the girl, finally, there was going to be a marriage. This is the story. Now, I don't know whether this has been added to it or not, but there was going to be a marriage, and one of the other ladies wanted that man. <laughs> and so she arranged for the white lady to go home <laughs> so she wouldn't marry the brave that she wanted. And um, we, we've heard the Wampler story. Now, that happened, I think, up in Ohio, but the Wamplers did... Uh, moved down in this area, some of the descendants. And I read a story of an episode over in Marion where several children were kidnapped. And a woman was scalped, and she survived it. And do you know, I, I can't believe her husband did this, but he, he left her. He said her beauty was gone. She was so disfigured that he left her. And I thought, I mean, I have no words to describe how that upset me. But um, to describe the going on to how they lived around here, you can see the, the round building, uh, the round structure there in the middle. And that's what is very typical. There were no teepees in this area, folks. They didn't have teepees here. They didn't have any reason to. A teepee was a portable shelter that could be taken up and moved. All those poles were moved. and. They would have, now, something that they did make a lot, and my dad showed me how to make that little uh, hunting shelter that's up in the top right. And what he did, he would bend over a sapling and tie it on with just honeysuckle or something like that. And then they would put limbs down the side and put pine needles on it. And I, I'm from Georgia, so we had lots of pines down there. And uh, I think I showed you this picture already. Now, we're going to come, what's our time? How is our time doing? 250. 2.50, so we should be closing up now, I guess. Um, this shows you a little bit about the different routes that were taken for the Trail of Tears. 
And that is one of the saddest episodes I know of in American history. Um, David Crockett was in Congress at that time and he got up on his desk and hollered at those people and he said, these people, this was once a proud race, the Cherokee were, and he said, you have, you are demeaning them. And he said, I vote no. And the Cherokee by this time, this was 1830s, by this time they had already assimilated. I mean, the war was over. All the fighting, all the scalping had been over for a uh, good 40 years by this time. And they had assimilated so much into the white man's world. They totally were wearing the garments. They um, were living in homes. Let's see if I have it. Yeah. This is um, Major Ridge's home in Georgia. It's still standing in Rome, Georgia. I used to live real close to Rome. Um, I mean, folks, that's better than what we live in today. They had um, New Echota down there in Calhoun, not far from Rome. They had their own newspaper. They had their own constitution. They had their own government. They, they were... There was no reason for this. The reason was they found gold right up there. And this is Major Ridge here and the two people that signed the treaty with Andrew Jackson. And I have to say, you know, just give the United States a little slack here. They did, they did supposedly give them $3 million for their land. It wasn't just taken from them. A lot of people did not realize that. It was supposedly put in a trust fund, but there was no bookkeeping for that, and nobody knows what happened to it. <laughs> and if it was anything like Congress funds things today, um, it could have gone anywhere, you know, in somebody's pocket. But the Cherokee took care of this situation. These were the three men that signed that treaty with um, Andrew Jackson. And it was not authorized by the rest of the chiefs. Major Ridge and these two men with him were assassinated by the Cherokee. And they, they took care of their trees and they considered it treason. And that's all I have. Any questions? I know that was a kind of a, a real quick rush job, but uh, are there any questions at all? Nobody. Okay, well, I'm going to tell you a little bit then about the clothing. I mentioned this, uh, this kind of a shawl that they would wear. Um, this was a trade shirt, and they would normally wear it with a trade belt. This one's beaded, but uh, uh, usually a calico. But these, a lot of these shirts came over here already made, but this one is uh, typically made like they would make it. And they would have a wrap around, the women wore wrap around wool skirts, and this is one I repurposed, it's, it was a coat, but they would wear a wool skirt under that, and they would wear leggings, sometimes they would be out of wool as well, and they might repurpose, you know, just take a blanket and make it, and so that's what they did. Um, I, I want to read you, now this, this is pretty interesting, this is the letter that DeSoto sent, I mean, not the letter, but it, it's a copy of it. Whenever he was coming into the different uh, tribes there and the different territories, he, he would send this ahead of him by a translator, and they would read this. And it said, with the aid of God, we will enter your land by force and make war by every means we can. We will take your wives and make them slaves and your sons and daughters our slaves, and we will take your property and do to you and your family all the evil and harm that we can. And not only did, unless they cooperated, and their cooperation was not just giving them all the food they wanted, but giving them all the women that they wanted. And that was what was over the top for the Cherokee, and they tried to fight it. But they had brought not only leg irons and chains and collars, but they had brought mastiff dogs. That's one of the biggest dog breeds there is, and they were trained to kill humans. And so they, they had a, hundreds of those things. 
I mean, it was it was terrible. I mean, that's nothing new. I mean, that's Alexander the Great. You know, uh, he even had trained elephants. You know that he used, but this this was done, and um, just a little word about their religion. Uh, I hope y'all. Uh, I don't know. You may not be Christians, and I don't want to offend anybody, but I do want to show you a different light to look at Psalm 91, and this is in the Indians' eyes. This is a very important psalm to them. And I will say this, they sang songs in praise of God all the way to uh, Oklahoma. It took 280-something days to travel over there. It takes me two days, but um, my daughter's over there. But they um, sang a song, they said, Lord Jesus, you have done so much for me. What can I do for you? While they were being taken over force, by force. And there were some, some of the troops that were so impressed by their faith that one whole company became Christians because of it. But I want to read this to you because it was very important. And y'all can have a copy if you want. It says, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And they had these shelter rocks, so the, the, the refuge was very important. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. So they, they could relate to that, and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and I've got feathers on here. Under his wings you shall trust. His truth will be your shield and buckler. And they had shields. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flies by daytime, or uh, for the pestilence that walks in darkness or the destruction that comes at noonday. A thousand will fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come nigh thee. And you can see why that meant so much to them. I can't think of a, a more appropriate Cherokee psalm in the whole Bible, that that's just that means a lot to them, and and they were Christian. One of the first things that they published when they got their press at New Echota was um, the Bible. They put it in their own language, and they ha also did religious tracts. And I, I just think that that's just a very sad. <laughs> I I can't tell you how sad that 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 episode in American history is that, that it happened to civilized people. And how how did we wind up with the Eastern Band right down here in Cherokee? Have any of you ever gone to see that outdoor drama that they do? Okay, you may know the story of Solly. But Solly was a, a Cherokee that minded his own business and he lived right down there close to Brevard, North Carolina. And um, he, he wasn't aware of the negotiations with the government or anything like that. And you may know that uh, Chief Ross's son was educated at Harvard and actually took this case to the Supreme Court about the removal and won. And um, our president, Andrew Jackson, said for the guy, I think it was John Marshall, said, come and force it, Supreme Court, you know, we're doing it anyway. But... Um, It was just, it was just such a, a sad sad time, and you know for anybody to suffer like that. But Solly just wasn't keeping up with the news. He he just gardened. He had his family around him, and he had property there, and would garden and take care of stuff. And the next thing he knows, the soldiers are rounding him and his family up, and he's you know he, he didn't know what's going on, and. As they were taking them, they, they took them to corrals like cows, you know. And um, as they were herding him and his family up, he he told his wife did something, and they prodded her with a bayonet. That made him mad. So he started speaking in Cherokee to his sons and the people with him. Uh, at the next curve on the trail, I'm going to stumble and fall. And he said, we're going to get out of here. And they didn't intend to kill anyone, but of course one of the soldiers got killed. And so they hightailed it into the woods and they were hiding out in a cave in Clingman's Dome and they were not the only Indians that were hiding out in caves and there were people up here at White Top 
hiding out. And anyway, the there was a um, general, uh, I think it was captain or somebody sent down with the military by Jackson to round everybody up, and uh, all these people that were in the caves, and they couldn't catch them. And it was just causing a lot of hardship. And they finally sent Solly a message, and they said, if you will accept the punishment for this death of this American soldier and take his punishment, we'll let the rest of these people go. And so I don't know how many years this went on, but um, he, did, he, he said, I will do that. He said, but I don't want a firing squad of American soldiers. I want Cherokee to do it. And he said, I don't want a blindfold. I want to see what's going on. And they shot and killed him right down there. And the Americans did keep their word for a change, and they let the uh, Cherokee stay. And they were able to purchase. That is not a reservation at Cherokee, North Carolina. It's called the Quala Boundary. It's a trust. And I can't, I think it was something. Greg, do you know how many acres they actually purchased? It seems like it's something like 300,000 acres that they got. And they they pulled one on the white people. They got the, the, uh, the what do you call that, casino down there now. So they're getting the white people's money now. <laughs> I mean, that's quite, I mean, it, it's quite a thing for them. I mean, it, they're very affluent now. Yeah, yeah, they sent it all the kids to school on it, <laughs> and, and this, this, they turned it around. So I, I think that's fabulous. So that's all I've got. And I'll, I'll hush this time. <laughs> so. Oh, I do have something to give away. I wanted to um, kind of have a little remembrance of this, and I'm, I'm going to... Um, I had a feather in a chair. Did anybody see that white feather that was in a brown chair? Is it still in one? Anybody sitting in a chair with a white feather in it? How about one in the floor? Do you see? Anybody pick it up? I think I did. Okay, well, you get this then. This is a journal, and it has a lot of the pictures and maps that, that we uh, talked about today, and it's even got Dragon Canoe in there. Thank you. And, uh, anyway, that's... My gift, I'm going to send this one with some of the people that have kids. So this is a smaller version of it. Anyway, uh, don't judge a person until you've walked in their moccasins. <laughs> All right. God bless. Now, if anybody wants a copy of the psalm, I do have several copies of this up here, and you, you're welcome to take those. And you're welcome to come up here and look at anything on the table. And this would have been uh, Nancy's little staff that she she had as well. With the that's a, another swan feather in there.